Hello, my name's Ellen Swift and I'm going to be talking about belts and belt fittings. A wide variety of Roman belt fittings survive in the archaeological record, most often made out of copper alloy, and sometimes of other materials such as iron, bone or ivory. Unlike today, belts with buckles were not widely worn by ordinary people in the Roman period. Instead, for men, they were particularly associated with military costume. Soldiers would be dressed in a tunic with a belt around the waist. This association with military costume means that we find buckles and belt fittings most commonly at Roman military sites or other locations where military personnel were stationed, such as major towns. The soldiers always wore them, whether in armour or not. It identified their status and provided somewhere to hang their side arms. Mike Bishop discusses armour and personal military equipment in other films. You just have to look at the Portable Antiquities Scheme to see the number of buckles that have been identified from all over Britain. Because leather is made from organic materials, it deteriorates quickly when buried and tends to survive archaeologically only when buried in very wet or very dry conditions. So belts don't often survive. Often the belt had not only a buckle, but also other metal fittings, such as a metal plate adjacent to the buckle, loops from which to hang equipment, metal stiffeners to strengthen the leather, and a protective metal strap end at the other end of the belt. It is possible to give broad dates to some buckles and belt fittings. In the 1st to early 2nd century, there were D-shaped buckles, made variously in copper alloy, iron or bone, sometimes with internal volutes, with buckle tongs in what is known as a fleur-de-lis design. By the 3rd century, belts had become wider and were fastened by ring buckles with plain tongs, now often missing. Strap ends were narrow and hinged in a variety of shapes. In the 4th century, belts remained wide with a variety of buckle shapes, but with strap ends that were amphora or circular shaped, quite distinctive. By the later 4th century, belts were very broad and highly decorated with rectangular and pentagonal copper alloy plates on both ends. The best evidence of how these later period belt sets were put together comes from cemetery contexts, where men were buried with belt sets. These sometimes allow a detailed reconstruction of the original appearance of the belt. A particularly impressive example was found in the Eastern Cemetery of Roman London. This belongs to a type of very elaborate, wide belt set that is particularly associated with Roman military sites on the Rhine and Danube frontiers in continental Europe and is thought to have been worn by both high-ranking soldiers and civilian officials who took on a nominal military status in the late Roman period. There are not very many examples from Britain, which makes this one all the more significant. It has a type of ornament known as chip carved, which refers to the technique of production of the original mould, not the actual belt, which is cast. In its original state, it would have been a golden coloured copper alloy with tinning and black niello inlay. In the late Roman period, niello inlaid belt fittings become popular. Niello is a black metal sulphide inlay, and it was used to make a contrast between an engraved design filled with niello and the bright shiny surfaces of the belt itself. Of course today, many surviving belt fittings have an oxidised green surface, so it's hard to get a sense of their original appearance. As we have seen from the previous examples, belt fittings are often highly decorated, and this can be a good way to date the material. Sometimes they are enamelled with quite complex designs. This type of decoration occurs in the earlier Roman period. Openwork belt fittings are found throughout the Roman period. In this type of design, the belt underneath would be visible through the holes, and so interesting contrasts between the metal and the colour of the belt could be created. Here's an example of an early Roman openwork design. We can see that the design is based on leaves and tendrils, although it's quite stylized rather than realistic. And here's an example of a late Roman openwork belt attachment with a more geometric design. This belt fitting has zoomorphic ornament, 
that is, decoration based on representations of animals. This is very common on late Roman belt fittings. The animals are usually very stylized, although sometimes different kinds of animals can be recognized. This buckle, for instance, includes representations of dolphins. Animal ornamented belt fittings are found more frequently in the frontier zones of the Western Roman Empire and have sometimes been suggested to be a product of non-Roman culture. For instance, that of the Germanic barbarians living beyond the Rhine and Danube frontiers. However, motifs such as this one, the dolphin, help to confirm that the decoration stems from mainstream Roman culture. Dolphins are often represented in Roman mosaics and in other Roman metalwork, for instance, on metal vessels. A particularly interesting type of zoomorphic belt buckle is decorated with horses' heads on the buckle loop. These buckles are small and were worn with long, narrow belt plates. These horsehead type belt sets, to use the technical classification, Hawks and Dunning type 1B, have a regional distribution in Britain in the southwest and come from very late contexts. One was found at Lankhills with a coin of AD 388 to 395, and they are also found quite often in Anglo Saxon cemeteries. They show how material culture in Britain was becoming more regionalised at the end of the Roman period, with very local production and distribution. In this period, it is also likely that buckles started to be used by a wider range of the population than just military personnel, as we find them increasingly often in non-military contexts. Horsehead belt sets also sometimes have Christian motifs on them, for instance the peacock, tree of life or Cairo motif. This is composed of the first two letters of the name of Christ in Greek. This displays their owner's allegiance to Christianity. An even later type of belt fitting is shown here in the so-called coit brooch style. Belt fittings in this style were also produced in a region of Britain, this time in the southeast. Although like the horsehead buckles, they imitate some aspects of late Roman belt fittings from continental Europe. At the end of the Roman period in Britain, there was widespread economic collapse and a sharp decline in the availability of new objects. These quite brooch style belt fittings are one of only a very small number of object types that we can date confidently to the first half of the 5th century, after the period of Roman withdrawal from Britain, but before the widespread influence of Anglo-Saxon material culture. As I have said, the buckled belt was generally worn by men, but what about women? Roman women tended to wear their tunics with a tie or belt under the bust rather than at the waist. It allowed them to pull the excess fabric up and over the belt or girdle so that it would hang in folds. In the first to third centuries, their belts were of twisted cord. In the late third and fourth century, the fashion grew for cloth belts, perhaps with some sort of gem or brooch fastened on the front. Then, when two tunics became the fashion in the late Roman period, the tie became a proper leather belt. If you want to find out more about Roman belt fittings, Bishop and Colston's book on Roman military equipment is a good place to start. And for late Roman belt fittings, see Hawks and Dunning's work, Soldiers and Settlers in Britain, 4th to 5th century. This can be found in the journal Medieval Archaeology for 1961 although it now needs revision.